Yes, uh, hello. hello, welcome everybody. Um, thanks a lot to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk today. I'm a PhD student at uh, ESO in Germany in my last year now, and today I want to talk to you about uh, global clusters and star clusters in general, and how we can use them as traces of galaxy property, properties. Sorry. So to give a short introduction, globular clusters are massive, dense star clusters that we can find in all types of galaxies. They are characterized by very old stellar ages, um, comparable to the age of the universe, and this makes them potentially very interesting probes of galaxy evolution, because we can um, assume that they still contain the information of the birthplace encapsulated in the stars we see today. In the Milky Way, we can get these beautiful pictures, as you see on the left-hand side, and we can study the, the internal workings of these globular clusters by analyzing really individual stars. But the globular clusters I will be talking about, they don't look like this, but are in fact at uh, higher distances, so appear as barely resolved point sources, even with the HSD. So what you see here is an uh, HSD image of M87, the central galaxy in the Virgo cluster at 16 megaparsec in this case. And this is uh, to illustrate you how globular cluster systems in distant galaxies can look like. If we look in this uh, zoomed in region here, I hope you can see all these little specks that appear a bit like stars, but they are in fact globular clusters. So millions of stars tightly packed together in half red radii of only a few parsec, but at great distances. So uh, the globular clusters I'm considering, I'm, I'm really not considering any internal structure. For me, they're quite simple objects with a single line of sight velocity and a single metallicity in H. But uh, one important aspect that we can have when we study external globular cluster systems is that we can cover large fractions of galaxies and we can study globular clusters also in the outskirts of galaxies where the galaxies themselves become very faint. And so uh, the, the study of integrated light is uh, very challenging. And here, globular clusters become very interesting for external uh, studies or extragalactic astronomy in general because they might serve as very powerful point source traces of the underlying galaxy. And I'm putting this here as a question because this is exactly what we want to test now with the project I want to show you. And we can test this by using news data because with news, with integral field spectroscopy, we can actually test how do the globular clusters compare to the underlying galaxy by using exactly the same data. So the data I'm using is from the Fornax 3D project. This was already introduced yesterday by Ignacio. Um, the Fornax 3D project is a large program with MUSE targeting 32 galaxies in the central region of the Fornax cluster, meaning at the distance of 2 megaparsecs now. And uh, the survey covers uh, the central regions of galaxies, but we also have some middle and also so-called halo pointings covering up to two or three RE. Uh, we also have a more or less broad range in galaxy masses from the dwarf regimes where we have some late types of gas rich galaxies and more massive galaxies that are then early types and gas free. So if you're interested in Phonax 3D, this conference is really offering uh, the opportunity for you to learn a lot about it because there are several other talks and posters um, you, can, you can have a look at. So talking now about globular clusters, how do we get them from the news data? So if you look at this uh, galaxy here, this is an early type uh, one in the Fornax cluster, we see this imprint of news here. This is one arc minute on the sky, meaning roughly six kiloparsec per pointing squared, of course. And uh, if you look at this white light image, you can't see any globular clusters. And this is because there we have this data of the central regions. So the globular clusters are hidden here among the bright light of the galaxy. So the first step is to get rid of this galaxy light. I'm using a multi Gaussian expansion model to do that. And then we end up with a residual. And in this residual, we now have all these point sources turning up. And these are, in fact, globular clusters, or many of those at least. So to, to really find the ones that are truly globular clusters, we first cross-reference with an existing photometric catalog from the HSD. Uh, but then in what really is a crucial part here is that we have with MUSE the possibility to extract individual globular cluster spectra. And we can also get rid of the galaxy light in these spectra by um, removing um, con the contribution of the galaxy in the annulus around it. 
So in the end, we end up with a cleaned globular cluster sample for all of these galaxies, and we can look at the spectra and do fitting and get line of sight velocities and the felicities. So in the end, I did that for the full sample of Fornax 3D, uh, and we now have a, a catalog of 722 globular clusters with line of sight velocity measurements, and the subsample of those are also bright enough that we can get uh, more or less accurate metallicities. Of course, now there is a large number of things we can do with such a data set. Uh, for this talk, I want to focus on two aspects. First, talking about kinematics, so really asking the question, how well do globular clusters trace the kinematics we see in the underlying galaxy? If you look at this image here, this is showing you the line of sight velocity map of one of the galaxies, and we now have the opportunity to put here the globular clusters on top. And you can see in this case, the globular cluster system is very nicely tracing what is happening in the galaxy. We see it's rotating in the same sense as the galaxy itself. But in order to um, quantify this a bit more, we built a quite simple um, kinematic model that describes the total globular cluster system rotation and velocity dispersion, but it has, for example, no radial change in these numbers because uh, yeah, in most galaxies, we only get a few handful of uh, global cluster measurements. So it's quite a simple model, but still we can compare directly the galaxies to the global clusters. And the result of this is shown here. So you will see um, on the left hand side the rotation velocity of the global cluster systems versus host galaxy, and on the right hand side the global cluster dispersion. If we fill now this with uh, the points, you can see that um, each of the, the symbols refers to one of the galaxies, we can see, okay, yes, the globular clusters follow very nicely the velocity dispersion that is also seen in the stars. And uh, this is increasing with stellar mass as evident from this color coding. This is not surprising, but I think it's a very nice confirmation that we really have here traces that trace the dynamical or the enclosed mass uh, in a similar way as the stars do. If we look at the velocity, the rotation velocity, the picture is a bit more diverse. We certainly have some galaxies where the globular clusters are tracing what is happening in the stars, for example, these ones here. But then we also have some galaxies, these ones, where uh, the globular clusters are tracing the rotation of the spheroid, while these galaxies are edge on as zero galaxies. So here we have. Uh, yeah, the, the host velocity is very strongly boosted by us seeing the disk edge on. And this is not captured with the globular clusters. If you're interested in more uh, yeah, globular cluster velocity measurements in Fornax, I invite you to have a look at Avinas Chaturvedi's poster. He has collected a, a great sample of, of globular cluster velocities. So um, moving on, uh, I want to briefly talk also about metallicities. Uh, and here I want to show you the total relative metallicity profile from the, all of the Fornax 3D globular clusters. So this plot shows you the relative metallicity, meaning for each globular cluster we can, because we have news data, we can subtract the metallicity of the host at each position. So globular clusters at zero will have exactly the same metallicity as the host galaxy, while uh, globular clusters at other metallicities have a, a difference there. So if I populate now this plot, you can see that there's much going on. We have a population of globular clusters. These are color coded in red by their G minus Z color, which is traditionally used as a proxy for metallicity. Um, and these red globular clusters indeed trace the metallicity of the host galaxy from the central regions to the yeah, to many of effective radii. Maybe just to reiterate here, this is the full sample of Fornax 3D, so combining all galaxies. But then we also have some blue globular clusters and they are much more metal poor in general. And this is very nicely fitting in this picture of um, yeah, red versus blue globular clusters where the general idea is that the red ones are metal rich and they have formed together with the host galaxy while the blue ones were created in, uh, from low mass metal poor systems. And with such a figure, we can really, really see that, but it also confirms that the red ones really trace the, the metallicity of the host over large radii. So this is what I wanted to say about globular clusters. Um, I want to spend the last five minutes to briefly talk about a different type of star cluster, namely nuclear star clusters. So as the name suggests, nuclear star clusters 
sit in the centers. Yes, thank, thank you. Uh, they sit in the centers of uh, galaxies. And this is just one example, but in general, nuclear star clusters are denser and brighter than globular clusters. So even easier, more easy to observe in distant galaxies, but also more complex, as I want to convince you in the, the next slide. So recently I've been working on collecting star formation histories of nuclear star clusters, again, directly comparing them to the underlying host galaxy. So this is what you see here. This is uh, one um, early type galaxy that has a nuclear star cluster that is very old, as you see from this um, star formation history, but also very metal rich as given by the color. So this is the star formation history obtained from PPXF. And um, if we compare this to the host, we can see it's as old as the host galaxy and slightly more metal rich. We also can have nuclear star clusters that uh, have yeah, very complex star formation histories like this one. It's very prolonged. Uh, we don't have to focus on every single detail here, but we surely see some extended star formation happening and even some very recent one happening in this nuclear star cluster. Again, more or less tracing what is also seen in the galaxy or in the central regions of the galaxy. But then finally, we can also have systems like this one. And I think here it really becomes interesting because this is a um, dwarf galaxy where the nuclear star cluster is significantly more metal poor than the host galaxy. I hope you can see this from the color difference here. But um, if we look at the ages, they're more or less on average the same but really the metallicity is, is very much different. And we have here in the nuclear star cluster even some quite recent uh, star formation happening. So what is causing this? Uh, well, this is quite a nice um, confirmation for a metal poor or few metal poor globular clusters that made their way to the center of this dwarf galaxy, uh, yeah, enabled by short dynamical friction timescales to build up this nuclear star cluster uh, with some additional gas accretion or gas uh, yeah, and star formation happening in this nuclear star cluster. So here it really becomes more complicated. It's no longer uh, exactly what is happening in the, the galaxy center. But of course, because if we are able to disentangle all these effects, so in, in situ star formation and accretion of metal poor globular clusters, we are also able to exploit this complexity yeah, complexity in nuclear star clusters and learn a lot about the central uh, formation of galaxies over yeah, the cosmic time. So with that, I want to come to my summary. I hope I've convinced you that with MUSE, we can really test how global clusters, star clusters in general, compare to the host galaxies. We have seen that they are very valuable traces in distant systems. And uh, yeah, nuclear star clusters should not be neglected. They can also tell us something about the central evolution. Thank you.